Good morning. My name is Larry Holman and I live in Vicksburg, Mississippi. I've been a member of the Orangeburg German Swiss Genealogical Society for about eight years and this marks my first Oktoberfest presentation. My only claim to fame with the society is I'm the one who digitized our newsletters and put them on CDs a few years back. I've been married to my wife, Kay Naren Holman, for 42 years, and we have two adult daughters and four young grandsons. I'm a retired mechanical engineer from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. My connection with this historic Orangeburg district is through my immigrant ancestor, Conrad Holman, who, along with his second wife, arrived in Charleston in January of 1750 on the ship Greenwich. I have two distant cousins living in this area, Dr. Bob Holman, formerly of Ellery and now living in Columbia, and Capers Holman III of Creston, who lives on and farms the original land-grant land of 1750. This past May, Annette Bouette sent me an email inviting me to make a presentation at Oktoberfest on the topic shown on this slide. Before I could respond to her, I had to check my schedule, and it was then I realized I had a conflict and could not attend. This topic has always fascinated me because I did not know what route my ancestors came to Mississippi in 1836. So this invitation would give me a strong incentive to do some research and then maybe make a presentation. I thought about it for a day and decided, yes, I'll do it. I sent my answer back to Annette in a proposal of a wild idea. Yes, I'll do it, but it would need to be done through a pre-recorded slideshow, and I had not done that before. She passed my proposal on to the board, and Margaret accepted it on their behalf a few days later. So here we are. You're seeing, you're seeing my slides and hearing my voice but I'm not there. I hope it works out and you learn something from it. If it doesn't work out, we'll just blame the computer operator. I'd like to thank Margaret, the board, Eric, Annette, and others for giving me this opportunity. Hopefully this will be just the beginning of distance learning experiences for the future. So with that introduction over, Westward Hope the Federal Road and its impact on the westward migration. The Federal Road of Alabama, a former ancient Indian trail, helped usher in a new era of national expansion, communications, and exploitations and removal of Native American Indians from the southeastern United States. It functioned as a major thoroughfare for the western migration of settlers and slaves into the old southwest for the first three decades of the 19th century. As a military road, it aided in the movement of troops sent to defend the vulnerable western margins of the young United States. I will discuss its historical origins, the early postal road period, the conversion to a military road, an all travelers road, and then its ultimate demise. I will then complete my presentation with a discussion on how our ancestors traveled, why they left their homes in South Carolina, what were their experiences, and predict possible routes some of them may have traveled to their final destinations in the Old Southwest. Before I begin, I need to clarify some terms. First is the expression Old Southwest. Historians use this term to describe the early 19th century frontier region that was bounded by the Tennessee River to the north, the Gulf of Mexico to the south, the Mississippi River to the west, and the Okmulgee River in central Georgia to the east, basically the present-day states of Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. Second, the use of the term Federal Road or Old Federal Road can be associated with either of two early 19th century Indian trails that became important roadways into the Old Southwest. 
both connected the eastern border of Georgia with settlements to the west. These two trails are distinguished from each other as the Federal Road of Georgia and the Federal Road of Alabama. Both intersected at Augusta, Georgia with the Georgia Road depicted in green on this map heading northwestward toward Ch Chattanooga with a branch going to Knoxville. The Alabama Road depicted in red headed southwestward toward Macon and Columbus, Georgia then to near Montgomery, Alabama, and ultimately terminating near Mobile, Alabama. So now I will focus on the Federal Road of Alabama. The historic origins of the Federal Road of Alabama probably began centuries ago as an Indian trail that ran from the vicinity of modern day Montgomery, Alabama, southwestward toward the mouth of the Alabama River just north of modern Mobile. Over much of this distance, an ancient path followed ridges dividing the valley of the Alabama River to the west from the valleys of the Conoco and Escambia Rivers to the east, giving travelers a path largely unimpeded by streams, swamps, and other natural obstacles. This slide shows the early Indian trails on this 1733 French map by Baron de Cernay. In the upper right hand corner is the vicinity of Montgomery with the Alabama River running to the center and then down to the bottom of the map where it connects at the Mobile Bay. The central river running from top to bottom and entering at the same location as the Alabama is the Tom Bigby River. The river to the left is the Pascagoula River that is in present day Mississippi. In the days before the arrival of European colonists, these trails connected the towns of southeastern Indians and served many purposes. They were traveled by hunting party, parties going to and from traditional deer and bear hunting grounds. War parties used the paths of, these, of their enemies in the search of vengeance and captives and trade goods moved over great, these great distances at first on the backs of humans and then later on pack horses. By the late 17th and early 18th centuries, explorers, traders, agents, and a few missionaries all from European colonies in America converged on this land known as the Creek Nation from three directions. The British came west from Charlestown and the Spaniards came northwest and north from St. Augustine and Pensacola, and the French came northeast from Mobile. Each of these European nations wanted to dominate the land that later would become the state of Alabama. As traders arrived, they drove pack horses laden with deer skins and other hides and pelts out of the interior and over existing Indian trails and left behind cloth, firearms, knives, and other manufactured goods. S despite the attention given to this exchange of goods, the flow of information throughout the region was just as important. News traveled quickly by means of these trails, and the southeastern Indians remained remarkably well informed about distant events. When speed was paramount, the more astute European and American officials employed native runners to carry important correspondence overland instead of relying on their own shipborne mail systems linking the coastal era, colonial era coastal towns. These ancient trails, or portions of them, would become roadways for the future migration of European colonists and Americans seeking adventure and a fresh start in the Old Southwest. By the time American independence was declared from Great Britain in 1776, American colonists had push, pushed the line of settlement westward to the Appalachian Mountains. After the American Revolution, westward movement of settlers intensified. 
as part of the 1783 Treaty of Paris that ended the war, the young United States acquired the British claims to all lands east of the Mississippi River. In June of 1792, Kentucky became a state by separating from Virginia. Then in 1796, Tennessee became a state. In April of 1798, Congress created the Mississippi Territory out of the lands north of the 31st parallel formerly claimed by the colony of Georgia. By 1804, the territory possessed two white settlements, one at St. Stephen's on the lower Tom Bigby River, north of Mobile, and Natchez on the lower Mississippi River. The territory's boundaries included Spanish Florida to the south, the Mississippi River to the west, the state of Tennessee to the north, and to the east, Georgia, which had grudgingly relinquished its claim to the area in 1802. On this slide, I show the general regions of the southeastern American Indians. Between the Tom Bigby River settlement of St. Stephen's and the western part of Georgia lay the Confederacy of the Creek Indians, extending its boundaries northward well toward the Tennessee line. Adjoining the creeks on the north lay the territory of the Cherokee, extending eastward into Georgia and northward into Tennessee. Both the Tom, between the Tom Bigby River and the Lower Mississippi River lay the lands of the Choctaw, and northward to, of them, the country of the Chickasaw took in the northwestern corner of future Alabama and extended across northern Mississippi and into western Tennessee. Any crossing of these regions would require dealing with these various Indian nations. Indian agents during British colonial rule were dispatched into these areas to establish trade and gain access into and across their land. The use of these agents continued to be an important position under the young United States government and Colonel Benjamin Hawkins appointed in 1795 by good friend George, President George Washington will play a vital role over the next 20 years in securing the trust of the Creek Indians and negotiating treaties to cross over and acquire their land. In 1803, President Thomas Jefferson authorized the purchase of New Orleans and the Louisiana Territory from France, effectively doubling the size of the United States. Jefferson understood the importance of safe and adequate transportation for military defense and commercial interest in the newly acquired settlements of Louisiana. He lobbied to build a road through the Creek Territory, recognizing that the future of Southern commerce depended on easy access to the Port of New Orleans. On October the 31st, 1803, Congress passed enabling legislation giving the President the power to establish lines of communication to protect and to protect the new territory. Jefferson acted quickly to establish these lines of communication between the capital and New Orleans. Homework had already been done <coughs> by Postmaster General Gideon Granger in September when he had ordered a trial run to New Orleans over the Natchez Trace. If horses were changed every 30 miles and riders every 100 miles, Natchez could be reached in 15 days. Still, the exchange of dispatches between Washington and the western reaches of the region would take more than a month at least. Jefferson lost no time in starting the process. Immediately after the, en the Enabling Act was signed, a post rider left Washington carrying important documents for the officials in the new region. In November 1803, Secretary of War Henry Dearborn asked Colonel Hawkins to suggest a location for the road. Dearborn also asked General Wilkinson of New Orleans to report on the feasibility of a road from Hawkins Place on the Flint River in western Georgia to New Orleans by way of the Alabama and Tom Bigby Rivers. 
Wilkerson reported back that there were two possible routes from the Coweta Indian Village on the west bank of the Chattahoochee to Mobile that should be considered. In February of 1804, Secretary Dearborn asked Colonel Hawkins to seek permission from the Creeks for an open road through their territory. In July of that year, Isaac Biggs, an assistant surveyor general of the United States, offered to survey a road from Athens, Georgia to New Orleans through the, Indian, the Creek Indian Nation. He would take observations of latitude and longitude at important points along the way. This task was done with great difficulty. Biggs and a companion had trouble ob obtaining local Indian guides, got lost several times, experienced fatigue, and came down with a fever. Finally, after four months, they arrived in New Orleans, having traveled more than a thousand miles from Washington. On December the 22nd, 1804, Biggs sent a letter to President Jefferson detailing his survey and stating that his survey was only 14 and a half miles longer than the 965 mile straight line distance calculated between the cities. Jefferson sent this information to Congress and on March the 3rd, 1805, they passed an act to establish a post road from Washington City to Athens, Georgia to New Orleans. On November the 14th, 1805, in the U.S. Capitol, a conference between the United States and representatives of the Creek Indian Nation resulted in the Treaty of Washington. Not only did this treaty allow the establishment of an official public postal service road in the new territory, it also established communication with troops that could face the Spaniards and the British in the critical corner of the United States. After an appropriations from the Congress for $6,400 on 21 April 1806, the Postal Department began the oversight of clearing a horse path running from Athens, Georgia to south of Columbus, Georgia to south of Montgomery, Alabama, then southwestward to Fort Stoddard, which is north of Mobile, Alabama, and then on to New Orleans. The road specifications required that the brush be cleared to a width of four feet trees laying across the path to be removed, causeways across the swamp bogs were to be made of logs five feet long, and logs were to be laid across the creeks. According to projections, the distance from Washington to New Orleans would be 1,152 miles, or 320 miles shorter than the route over the Natchez Trace and would also reduce the time by 10 days. As it turned out though, the Postal Department would later return to using the Natchez Trace as its main postal route, having found the Federal Road's shorter route impractical because of the many streams without bridges and ferries. In 1811, Fearing war with the British, the U.S. government widened and rerouted the postal horse path in order to create a military road for the movement of troops, supply wagons, and ordnance. It began at Fort Wilkinson near Milledgeville, Georgia, then the state capital, and headed southwest. At present day Macon, it entered the lands of the lower creeks, heading on toward the Chattahoochee River about nine miles south of Columbus and then followed closely the postal horse path on southwestward to Fort Stoddard north of Mobile. The road was built by the military. It was, it was intended to be sufficient for moving supply wagons, cannons, and men on horse and foot. The type of construction was similar to other military roads connecting Nashville, Natchez, and other critical locations in the west. It was not to exceed 16 feet in width. 
and not more than eight feet of the 16 was to be cut down to within six inches above the ground and smooth for passengers. Swamps and streams were to be causeways and bridged. The conversion of the horse path into a road for wheel vehicles quickly increased pioneer traffic through Creek Nation. Colonel Benjamin Hawkins, the Indian agent, reported that between October 1811 and March 1812, 233 vehicles and 3,726 people had crossed his Flint River Agency headquarters into western Georgia heading west. This increased traffic through Creek territory inflamed factionalism in the Creek towns and helped inaugurate a violent sequence of events that led to the Creek War of 1813 to 1814 and the eventual removal of the Creeks from their homeland. The Federal Road's logistical significance was also marked by the construction of several forts and other frontier outposts which followed in the wake of the advancing American Army as it fought the Red Stick faction of the Creek Indians. In March 1814, after several battles with the Red Stick, Stick Creek, General Andrew Jackson won a decisive, decisive battle over them at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend on the Tallapoosa River. The battle broke the power of these hostile creek creeks. Many were dead and others fled across the Spanish line into Florida. Later in 1814, the chiefs that remained met Jackson at the confluence of the Coosa and Tallapoosa at Fort Jackson and was forced to surrender a broad strip of their land running along the Florida border and all that lay west of the Coosa River. Thus, practically the entire Alabama Tom Bigby Basin was cleared of Indian title and secured this land for settlement by eager white pioneers. The Mississippi Territory was indebted to General Jackson not only for safety but also for room in which to grow. After 1814, a tenuous peace prevailed in the Creek Nation. The Treaty of Fort Jackson officially ended the fighting of 1813 to 1814, but it did not remove the threat of violent death at the hands of vengeful Indians. The British and Spanish allies of the hostile Creek and Seminoles were vanishing. The ratification of the Treaty of Ghent in 1815 concluded the War of 1812 and the United States had navigational rights to the Mississippi River. The Spaniards left Mobile for good in 1813 and ceded the Floridas in 1821. News that the United States had cleared these three obstacles in the path of expansion opening lands west of the Creek Nation and above the 31st parallel over which Fort Stoddard stood sentinel, made the Alabama and Tongbebe River valleys into magnets with settlers seeking fertile soil and a fresh new prospect of, of, of a new life. After three decades of constructing, improving, and traveling the Federal Road, its role as the primary means to cross Georgia and get to the new states of Alabama and Mississippi and further west was coming to an end. With the defeat and removal of the various Indian nations, settlers had the freedom to spread out and leave the security and safety of the Federal Road. As steam power technology was int introduced with the construction of steamboats, locomotives, and railroads in the 1820s and 1830s, travel over the Federal Road diminished considerably. Worsening economic times and the Panic of 1837 further reduced traffic along the road, thereby reducing to a trickle the rush for cheap land that had begun the Alabama fever in early 1820s. In 1844, 
Samuel Morris telegraph key essentially tapped out the final epitaph for the Federal Road by radically improving communication across large distances, lessening the need for frontier post roads as well. Additionally, the Carolinas and Virginia, having lost much of their best and brightest, began implementing scientific farming methods to restore fertility to their worn out soil. These faster, safer, and more reliable alternatives, and eventually the construction of a network of county, state, and U.S. highways contributed to the demise of the Federal Road. Although much of the Federal Road has disappeared, portions of it remain. In Alabama, these remnants can be found in Macon, Monroe, and Conakoo counties, among others. In 1820, thousands of pioneers entering Alabama had caught the Alabama fever. They usually came in family groups or with many of the neighbors that provided security and maintained a sense of familiar familiarity. They walked, rode on horseback, or hauled their worldly goods in hogsheads fitted with trunnions and axles so that the whole barrel could be pulled by horses, oxen, or by hand. They used all varieties of vehicles, from light carriages to crude wagons, and they also shared the road with early stagecoaches. The road was open to all kinds of travelers, from the rich to the poor and to the famous. We asked, why were pioneers and our ancestors heading west during the time of the Federal Road? Based on my research, these are some of the following reasons. First, escape threats of former home because of, of remaining loyal to the crown, which we call loyalists. Escape from the law, little or no inheritance, Indian threat removed, fresh start for the family, cheap fertile land, and leave behind worn out land. And lastly, get rich quick in white gold of cotton. Cotton. Yes, cotton was the primary impetus for the stampede to settle the fertile lands in the old southwest after the Creek War ended. Other than sugar cane, or sugar, none of the, none of the traditional staple crops of rice, tobacco, and indigo which were grown in the coastal states, mattered in the migration to the Old Southwest. The cotton stampede was a direct result of Eli Whitney's cotton gin invention that took place on the Georgia plantation in 1793. Before the gin existed, cotton was grown in inconsequential amounts due to its time-consuming labor separating the lint fiber from the seeds by hand. It took one slave one day to produce one pound of lint fiber. The earliest cotton gin could produce more than 50 pounds per day. In the late 18th century, Great Britain's textile industry was thriving and created a brisk demand for American cotton. This simple machine would go with early pioneer planters to the new territory and was even introduced to the Chickasaw Indians in northwest Alabama on the Tom Bibby River in 1801 in a place called Cotton Gin Port. Truly the seeds of a new economic force in this region and the United States were being planted in this new fertile territory. With the forced removal of the local Native Americans and the taking of their land, the floodgates were open for cotton-induced migration of whites and their slaves. Think about this. If the cotton gin had not been invented and the need for a large slave labor workforce was not needed, what would have happened to the institution of slavery? 
would there have been a civil war? I mentioned earlier that the Federal Road became a road for all travelers, rich or poor, and some famous. I would like to now mention just a few of the famous people who traveled it. Aaron Burr was Thomas Jefferson's first vice president who killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel and was accused of conspiring to commit treason by establishing his own empire west of the Mississippi River. In early 1807, when all his plans had failed, he surrendered and was arrested at Bayou Pierre, 30 miles north of New Orleans. He was later transported back to Richmond, Virginia, over the Federal Road to stand trial for treason, in which he was ultimately acquitted. Peggy Dow, wife of famed Methodist evangelist Lorenzo Dow, noticed recent improvements to the road when they traveled east from Natchez to Milledgeville, Georgia, by way of St. Stephen's in 1811. When on the east side of the Alabama River, she observed that the road was newly cut out and that fresh marked trees served for a guide. Andrew Jackson made and maintained his reputation by defeating and removing the Indians in the proximity of the Federal Road. He used it when he traveled to defeat the British at the Battle of, of New Orleans. French General Marcus de Lafayette, along with his son George Washington Lafayette, toured the United States for 15, 14 months in 1824 to 1825. His personal secretary recorded that their party was treated to an Indian stickball game described in all its formality and violence. Its star was Chief Chili McIntosh, son of recently murdered Chief William McIntosh. Lastly, I have here P.T. Barnum, Phineas Taylor Barnum. He just began his career as a showman when he crossed the Creek Territory from Columbus, Georgia to Montgomery, Alabama. He recorded this. The day previous to our starting, the mail stage had been stopped, the passengers all murdered, and the stage burned driver escaping almost by a miracle. We all armed ourselves with guns, pistols, bowie knives, etc., and started on our journey. Now I will discuss the migration from South Carolina into the Old Southwest by identifying a sampling of families who left the Orangeburg District during the Federal Road period and make educated guesses on how they may have traveled based on their final destination since most left no records of their route traveled. Early this summer, I made an appeal on our email list for information on South Carolina ancestors who left Orangeburg District and headed west in the early 1800s. I wish to thank those who have responded. Before I get to those families though, I would like to say that on our society's website, there is a section entitled Migrations, located on the home page. If you haven't used this resource, you need to look at it and find your family's name. It lists many families that migrated from the Orangeburg District in the early to mid-19th century westward to Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, and Arkansas. Most of this work was initially conducted by our own Gene Jeffries and updated by other family researchers in recent years. This work is generally undocumented and should not be treated as, our, as authoritative documentation for these families, but it's a good start to further your research. In a minute, when I talk about our ancestors who went west, Let's try to feel as if they may have felt. What emotions did they go through? 
when they decided that they were going to leave South Carolina? And then what emotions did they experience on their journey? Let's see if we can get into the mood. Close your eyes, or maybe just one of them, and listen to the emotions that I came up with. Anxiety and uncertainty of the unknown. Leaving family and friends, possibly never seeing them again. Excitement of the adventure. Hunger and thirst at times. Physical strain and pain from pushing wagons uphill and digging them out of the mud. All of the beauty of the landscape. Isolation from seeing no other humans. Cold and wet camps in the wilderness under the wagon with no fire. Relief to sleep in a tavern with a roof over your head. Sorrow from the death sorrow from the death of a loved one or a friend that was buried on the trail. Fear of attacks by hostile Indians, robbers, or wild animals. Finally, relief at finally arriving at your destination. Now to some of those families that were submitted to me. On 23 November 1811, Daniel McDaniel and his wife, four sons and two daughters of Barnwell District received a passport to cross Indian territory bound for Pike County, Mississippi. According to various family records, McDaniel was born about 1775 in Orangeburg District. He lived in the area near Willow Swamp Baptist Church near present-day Norway, South Carolina. His family, along with his neighbors, the Felders, Simmons, Varnados, and Tylers, all members of the Willow Swamp Church, moved together to Pike County. Based on their destination in South Mississippi, these families surely travel the Federal Road during its military days all the way to Fort Stoddard, north of Mobile, and then headed west to Pike, to Pike County, Mississippi. In the early 1820s, one of my collateral ancestors, Joseph Holman, and his wife Ann Parler, with their children, left the Bull Swamp area of Orangeburg District and settled in the Dutch Bend area on the Alabama River in Autauga County, Alabama. I have yet to determine if they were part of the 60, uh, 69 wagon uh, that left Orangeburg about the same time and settled in that same region. They all would have had to travel the Federal Road during the Alabama fever period from Augusta to near Montgomery and then cross the Alabama River into Autauga County and settle south of present-day Autaugaville, Alabama. In 1828, a wagon train of Orangeburg District families were on their way to Texas when at a stop in Rankin County, Mississippi, a young girl died after a fall from a vine. As a result, the Kirsch, Rhodes, and Myers family stayed and formed a church, which they named Shiloh, after their home church back in South Carolina. They would have traveled the Federal Road from Augusta to near Montgomery and then crossed the Alabama River and headed due west toward Demopolis, Alabama, then to Meridian, Mississippi, and then stopped about six miles southwest of present-day Pelahatchie, Mississippi. In 1836, my third great-grandfather, Elder John Holman, Jr., and his wife Elizabeth Young, and their grown children and wives, along with his two brothers and families of the Youngs and Tylers, left the same Willow Swamp Church area mentioned previously 
for Neshoba County, Mississippi. They would have traveled the Federal Road from Augusta to near Montgomery and there crossed the Alabama River and headed due west toward Demopolis, Alabama, then to Meridian, and then northwestward to Neshoba County, where the Choctaw Indians had recently been removed. There are other families that I could have mentioned, but I mainly wanted to show you that using a map such as the one shown, knowing your ancestors' South Carolina home lo location and their final destination, you can make a good estimate of the route they probably traveled. A copy of this map can be found in Volume 7, Number 1, of December 1997 of our Society's Newsletter. I will close by saying that the Federal Road of Alabama opened the Old Southwest as a postal horse path, allowed military transports to protect New Orleans and the new borders to the west, caused the Creek War of 1813 to 1814 and helped win the War of 1812 against the British and then it permitted tens of thousands of people from the Atlantic seaboard to come into the Old Southwest to start new life. The Federal Road helped usher in a new era of national expansion, communication and exploitation and removal of the Native American Indian who were in its path. The Federal Road of Alabama had a prof profound impact on the history of this region and the United States. Here are the primary sources I use for this presentation. The first is, a, is the uh, first book link study ever done on the Federal Road and is considered the Bible of the Federal Road of Alabama. The second source captures the personal experiences of many famous travelers over the road. And the third source is a recent study preceding archaeological investigations along the road that has an in-depth historical account of the road. It can, it can be downloaded from the internet and is shown in a link down below. The last source on cotton is a great book on the history of cotton's rise to power and its relationship to race and slavery. That concludes my presentation. If anyone has any questions or comments, please contact me at the information shown on this slide. I'd like to thank again thank you for this opportunity and have a great Oktoberfest. I wished I could be there with you.